So yesterday we did an example with the comparison test. It went something like this. So used to Taylor series that I keep using X's and I shouldn't. We saw we looked at something like this. And we saw that it diverged. And to see this, we used the comparison test. And the thing about the comparison test is that unless you want to spend like half an hour messing around, shrinking things, making things bigger, the comparison test really requires you to have some intuition about whether the series converges or diverges. So we made, I'll call it a guess, but it's an educated guess. We guessed that the series diverges because it looks like the harmonic series and the harmonic series diverges. And then we then we did the test. We found a smaller infinite sum that that diverges. And I let's see. I, I forget exactly the argument we made. We could probably reconstruct it. <laughs> but the art, what I want to suggest is that the comparison test is kind of missing the point. Why does this series diverge? Well, it diverges because it looks like a divergent series. And then, you know, sort of the technical part of the comparison test, um, how can we make this series smaller but still divergent? That's kind of getting us away from this initial intuition. So the goal of the limit comparison test is to be able to use this intuition directly without messing around with deleting terms or adding terms or changing things to n to make things bigger or smaller or replacing the natural logarithm with n or all the kind of stuff we did yesterday. And the limit comparison test is, oh, I'll state it first of all. The limit comparison test again requires that your terms be positive. And suppose we suspect or we believe that one series looks like another series and we know what the other series does.
we know it converges or we know that it diverges. <laughs> So again, the situation we have here where we can sort of mess around with the comparison test, but the real argument we're making is that this series looks like the harmonic series and the harmonic series diverges. Then the limit comparison test Take the limit as n goes to infinity of this ratio. Um, it doesn't matter which term is on top and which term is on bottom. If this limit is a finite and non-zero number. Our intuition is correct. And the series A sub n does whatever the series B sub n does. That is to say it, it either converges or diverges along with B sub n. And the reason or sort of Again, we're not really proving this stuff, but this is sort of getting at the intuition that these series are so similar that one of them is basically a constant multiple of the other. Like we know that these two series Either both converge or both diverge. And if you divide these, terms, you get K, a finite non-zero number. So this is a really strong condition, though. This is one of the series literally being a constant multiple of the other. Um, what the limit comparison test says is, well, if you divide them, maybe you don't actually get k, but maybe you get something that's close to k. Maybe as n goes to infinity, we do get k. Well, I guess writing that limit is a little, a little fatuous in this particular case. But again, we have a sub n, we have something that's not B sub, that's not K times A sub N. So when we divide these, we no longer just get K, but maybe these are close to being K. And um, that's formalized by a statement about a limit. So, 
ไม่มีทาง possess The real argument we want to make isn't that this series is smaller than something or bigger than something. The real argument we want to make is that this series looks like another series. And we know We know what this other series does. We know that it diverges. And the limit comparison test says, well, this is what we think is happening. Let's see if we can formalize the idea that these series are similar. Let's take this ratio, sort of starting to write whatever there. Let's take this ratio and let's take the limit as n goes to infinity. Lots of limits as n goes to infinity in these various tests, which is why It's so important that we have L'Hopital's rule down pat. This is indeterminate. This goes to infinity. That goes to infinity. So we can hit this with L'Hopital's rule. And we wind up with one. And it's important, again, it, you know, don't get confused, or may, maybe it wasn't likely that you would. Um, one provides a cutoff sometimes for a divergence or divergence with the geometric series. R equals one is a cutoff. With P series, P equals one is a cutoff. Here, one doesn't mean anything special, but what one is, is a finite and non-zero number. So our intuition that these series are similar was correct. Either they both converge or they both diverge. And the harmonic series diverges. So that series diverges as well. Um, I listed for the other tests we've looked at so far, I think I've listed pros and cons. I guess the main con here is that you do need intuition, intuition about functions. You know, which functions are big, which functions are small, Which functions are going to be important? Which functions aren't? Like,
something like this. Um, my belief, I, I, I re I'm not wrong to call it a belief because this is just a problem I made up five seconds ago, so I haven't uh, verified it yet. My belief is that this series is going to converge and that the limit comparison test is going to show that it converges. But that belief requires some sort of intuition or some knowledge of these functions. What that intuition is based on is that exponential functions are much, much bigger than squares or n's or ones. And because I have that intuition, I'm going to sort of suggest that of all of the things I have written down there, only the two to the n is really significant. The other stuff is tiny by comparison. And because I have that guess or that intuition, I say, well, I think this is like one over two to the n. And one over two to the n is another way of writing one half to the n. It's a convergent geometric series. So I think this is like a convergent geometric series. So I think that this converges and that we can show it. But again, I mean, you do have to sort of come up with this. It's not a completely mechanical process like the like the integral test was. With the integral test, you never have to think about it, really. You just take an integral and it either converges or it doesn't. But the pro is that we, once if we have this intuition, we can use it the intuition in a very direct way. And that's, again, that's different from the example we did yesterday, where we used this intuition. We said, okay, I bet this thing diverges. And then how do you show it? Well, I don't know, try to make stuff bigger or smaller, I guess. You sort of, you have the intuition, but then you can't use it in a very clear way. Here, we can try to use our intuition. And incidentally, the reason I'm saying, you know, it doesn't matter what's on top, what's on bottom, if you, you because I mean, the, the reciprocal of a finite um, non-zero number is a finite non-zero number. So, let's see, but is there, is there a convention? The convention is probably to put the series we think it looks like on the top and 
the actual series we have on the bottom. You had better get used to this, by the way. One of the most important tests in calculus is, al is also taking like fractions. So the situation where we have this fraction of fractions, and then we have to work with it. This is something we're going to see a lot by the end of this semester. And, you know, as a reminder, you multiply by the rate by the reciprocal of the bottom. Ooh, this is, I, I might have given myself a bear to work with. Um, two to the n times, um, so we multiply by the reciprocal of the bottom. So we have this in the denominator, and then we have this, and up on top, we have that one. Yeah, okay. This, this limit is definitely a finite number. This limit, in fact, is going to be one. Um, that uh, I don't know how easy this is going to be to actually prove, but let's try to fight it through. Um, the reason I say that we have a bear to work with is that in the denominator, we've got this product. So this looks like Lopetau's rule to me, but when we start taking derivatives down there, it's, it's going to be quite messy. But, but let's give it the old college try, and if it looks like it's not going to work out, we'll go to Desmos and we'll graph it and we'll get the limit informally that way. Um, you, you almost, you, you, I, I don't uh, know how likely it is that you actually remember how to differentiate two to the N. Um, when you take the derivative of an exponential function, you get the exponential function, but you also get the logarithm of the base. Uh, the reason e to the x is so nice. is that when you take the logarithm of the base, it's one. So <clears throat> if you haven't seen that in forever, there you go. So in the denominator, um, we use the product rule. So we'll take the derivative of two n. And we'll leave n squared minus n alone. And then we'll leave 2 to the n alone. And we'll take the derivative of n squared minus n plus 1.
And this is, um, I'm feeling kind of cautiously optimistic about this now that we've done it once. This is still indeterminate. Um, this is still infinity over infinity. But the reason I'm feeling cautiously optimistic is that in this denominator, we can pull out a two to the n, and we're still going to just have two to the n times some polynomial in parentheses. So now we have the natural log of two times n squared minus the natural logarithm of two times n plus the natural logarithm of two plus two n minus one. Okay, this is definitely going to work. I that's things, things your professor says before everything totally falls apart. But what I think is going to happen is that we're going to use L'Hopital's rule twice more, and then we'll be able to cancel the two to the n. Because you see, we can't, what we'd really like to do is just scribble those out. But we can't do that because we have that minus two to the n. Well, we use L'Hopital's rule once more. The minus two to the n will become a minus two. We use L'Hopital's rule a second time. The minus two will become zero. And we'll just have an exponential on top. And I think we'll be able to cancel. So... Now this bottom is going to be lengthy. Um, ln two times n squared. minus ln2 times n plus ln2 plus 2n minus 1. And Again, this is infinity over infinity. Um, I don't know how obvious that is, but what we have inside the parentheses looks really messy, but it's a quadratic. So two to the n is going to infinity and the quadratic is going to infinity. So the product is going to infinity. I made a typo. I wrote two to the n instead of n squared. And again, the top, um, I'm kind of just using intuition here, I admit. My intuition is, well, two to the n is so much bigger. It's an exponential. It's so much bigger than n squared that that should be going to infinity as well. Hit this with L'Hopital's rule again. Um, Wait, shouldn't it be two n on top? Minus two n, I think that's what we got. You're right. Second time I 
Miss Coffee. Uh, Frank, you. So the derivative of the top. Okay, so what I'm actually going to do, the derivative of the top is going to be um, ln2 times ln2 times 2 to the n minus 2. All right. Then just this fraction is getting so appalling. I sort of just want to look at that denominator as its own thing. The derivative of the bottom. So we take um the derivative of 2n, which is ln2 times 2n, where again, using the product rule, we leave this alone. Then, again, using the product rule, we leave the two to the n alone. Uh, and take the derivative of what was inside the parentheses. I uh, picked a, a singularly, I feel like if my goal was to convince you that the limit comparison test is nice and convenient, I probably didn't pick the absolute best second example, but so we've got the derivative of the top, ln2 square, uh, times two to the n minus two. All divided by the bottom, and the bottom is not as bad as it looks. I mean, it's it's kind of bad, but you see a two to the n and a two to the n. So again, you can pull the two to the n's out. And we have ln2 squared times n squared. Hold on. Nope, no, I, I, I was wondering if we could also pull out the natural log of two, but we can't because that two doesn't have an ln2 attached to it. Okay, so, and what I'm doing is this ln2 is going to distribute over everything, which is why the natural log of 2n squared became ln2 squared n squared. Um, minus ln2 squared n. Plus ln2 squared.
uh, plus ln2 times 2n. minus ln2 plus 2 ln2 times n minus ln2 plus 2 and just looking at this thing, if I say this, it might not be very convincing, but Lobotow's rule is actually working really well here, because in spite of all appearances, that numerator is getting simpler and simpler, and that denominator is not getting more complex. And I know that second part probably sounds like a lie. It looks like a lie. But what we started with in the denominator was 2 to the n times a quadratic. What we Wound up with after we used Lopetau's rule once was two to the n times a quadratic. We used Lopetau's rule again. What we wound up with in the denominator was two to the n times a quadratic. So I know it looks like this is just getting worse and worse, and maybe I will actually um, wave my hands a little over this last step, just because to write the denominator, we'll use Lopetau's rule one more time. to be very funny, or not funny at all. It makes me want to scream, but I, I actually think after all of this, um, this is not going to work. or rather it is going to work, but we're going to have to present an extended version of, um, of this rule we're using. Um, so we do this a second time. wind up with a zero, which is not what we'd ideally like to wind up with, because if we remember um, what we said the limit comparison test is, we said that um, we should be getting a limit that is between, I mean, a positive number, so not zero. Uh, actually, the, the limit comparison test can be expanded. Um, the fact that this limit is going to zero and the top converges should mean that the bottom converges as well. But am I, do I have that right? I don't know. The, the, we're, we're seeing in real time the, um, 
the risks involved and just making up an example and saying, I'll bet this will work. Um, so I apologize for that. Let's do our, um, our comment. Oh, I was going to, I, I keep, keep losing track of what day it is. Um, next week, I'll comment more on this example. What's it mean to get zero? If you get zero, can you still say something? The answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. For now, I just want to do an example of this that is unambiguously and easily going to work. So, um, intuition. Does anybody have any thoughts about whether this series converges or diverges? Well, it looks like the limit of the function would go to zero. That's true. So we can't use um so we can't use the nth term test to say that it diverges. But the nth term test, even when the limit goes to zero, the series might diverge. Um, the harmonic series is a good example of that. Limit goes to zero, but it diverges. Okay, so here's a fact of rational functions that is going to help you a lot uh, as you use this test and as you do the homework. Um, rational functions more or less look like they're leading per when n gets big enough. So, um, or rather polynomials, I mean to say. So the top of this rational function is n squared. The bottom, more or less, looks like n cubed. So speaking of the harmonic series, I would say that this more or less looks like one over N. And one over N, the harmonic series diverges. So that's my intuition. This time, uh, everything is going to be nice and we're not going to spend half an hour getting an ambiguous result. When we multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator, we get this. And now you can you can use Lopatow's rule if you want to. Maybe you don't have to go to the trouble. Um, like what's what's the horizontal asymptote of this rational function? Um, if if you don't remember how to find that, um, I, I mean maybe it's something you you can look up in your own time. Um, 
just because I, I that sounded dismissive, just because we're running up against the clock, not because I have any objection to to going over it with you, um, but because we're running up against the clock, let's just hit this with Lopatow's rule a few times. And the limit equals one. I feel like nine times out of 10, when I successfully use this rule, we get a limit that's exactly one. But again, the only thing that really matters is that we got a, po a positive finite limit. So these series do indeed either both converge or both diverge. The harmonic series diverges. So this diverges. Um, we'll spend a little more time on this. I, I really do want to talk about what happens when the limit is zero. That's not just um, trying to get out of an embarrassing situation. Sometimes when the limit is zero and sometimes when the limit is infinity, you do still get information. It's just a little more complicated. So I'll talk about that Monday. Having said that, I think you should be able to do at least most, maybe all of the homework assignment. So do your best. If you run into a roadblock, you know, well, we can talk about it Monday. It, it never bothers me if homework gets turned in a day late. And I will see you next week. I will... The current plan is to email your tests back to you, or at least get get the grades posted relatively quickly.